Chapter 15. What Came Down the Chimney Christmas Eve is real quiet. Like Freak says, you could hear a mouse fart. Which, even if it is a stupid joke, makes Grimm smile and shake his head. Freak and the fair Gwen have supper with us, and we're all trying to pretend like everything is normal, and nobody says a word about Killer Kane getting out of prison. The fair Gwen is wearing this dark red silky blouse and a long black skirt that almost touches the floor, and her waist is so small. She looks like one of those Christmas ornaments, the kind that makes a tingle bell sound when the branches move. Freak is all dressed up too. He's wearing this tweedy new suit jacket that has patches on the elbows, and Grimm says all he needs is a pipe, and he'll look like quite the professor. No tobacco, Freak says. Nicotine is a toxic waste of time. Just the pipe, Grimm insists. You don't have to smoke it. Don't get him started on bad habits, Graham says. Maxwell, pass the mint sauce. Mint sauce is one of Graham's specialties, and you'd be amazed how it improves everything, which is why I've been keeping it close by. Anyhow, the food is the best. You can't beat Graham for Christmas or Thanksgiving or birthdays, and we all eat until we've, we're fit to bust. Except the fair Gwen makes sure Freak doesn't eat too fast. You'd think I was starving him, the fair Gwen says. Please, sir, more gruel, he says, holding up his plate and making a funny face where his tongue sticks out sideways. And Graham laughs so hard she had a, a coughing fit, which makes us all shut up. After supper, we sit around like you do, admiring the tree and talking about how lucky we are not to be homeless. And Grim starts telling these old stories about when he was a kid and they got lumps of coal in their stockings. If we were lucky, we got an apple core, he says, or a few orange rinds. Now, Arthur, Graham says, you never got a lump of coal in your life. You're right. We never even got a lump of coal. Can you imagine? My father couldn't afford coal, so he'd write the word coal on a piece of paper and put it in our stockings and we'd pretend it was a lump of coal. That's how poor we were. The fair Gwen is laughing to herself and shaking her head. Graham says, how can you tell such lies on Christmas Eve? I'm telling tales, my dear, not lies. Lies are mean things, and tales are meant to entertain. And so we all sit there, acting polite and listening to Grimm make up stuff no one would ever in a million years believe, and all of us have a cup of hot chocolate and a piece of Russell Stover candy right out of the box, and then it's time to pass around a few of the presents. Graham has this rule that you can open one on Christmas Eve and you save the rest for Christmas morning, which can be tough deciding what to open first. Grim always starts it off because, like he says, he's really a kid at heart and he can't stand to wait. From Graham, he gets this woolly sweater that buttons up the front and he acts surprised, even though he's got about a hundred just like it already. Then Graham opens her present from me, which is a bracelet made of shells from beaches around the world. And she right away puts it on and says it's just what she wanted, which is so like Graham. If you gave her an old beer can, she'd act pleased and say it was just what she wanted. Then Freak opens his present for me, and even before he gets the paper all the way off, he gives me this thumbs up and says, Coal! It's a gizmo that looks like a jackknife. But really, it's a whole bunch of little screwdrivers and wrenches and even a little magnifying glass. I'm pretty sure Freak can invent stuff with it if he feels like it. Graham gives the fair Gwen this scarf that just happens to match her blouse, and everybody goes ooh and ah. And then I finally decide what present to open. Right away you'd know it was something Freak did because the box isn't square. It's pointed at the top like a pyramid. And instead of regular wrapping paper, he's got Sunday comics taped all over it. And it's driving me nuts trying to figure out what would fit inside a pyramid-shaped box. Freak says, Freak seems like he's just as excited as me, even though he already knows what he put inside. Take off all the paper first, he says. There's a special way to open it. Real careful, I peel off all the paper, and the thing is, it's not a pyramid-shaped box he bought somewhere. He made it. You can see where he cut out the pieces of cardboard and taped them all together, and written on the sides of the pyramid are these little signs and arrows. Follow the arrows, he says. The arrows point all over the place, and I have to keep turning the pyramid around until finally I get the, a sign that says, Press here and be amazed. Go on, Freak says. It's not an explosive device, silly. It won't blow up in your face. I press the spot in the pyramid, 
and all of a sudden, all four sides fold down at the same time, and I'm looking inside the pyramid, and just like Freak promised, I'm amazed. The young man is a genius, Grimm is saying, and I don't use that word lightly. Grimm is right about that, because Freak has the whole thing rigged with these elastic bands and paper clips, which is what made the sides unfold all at the same time. And inside is this little platform, and on the platform is a book. Not a normal book, like you buy at the store, but a book he made himself. You can tell that right away. It looks so special. I'm afraid to pick it up or I might ruin it. What I did was take all my favorite words, Freak says, and put them in alphabetical order. Like a dictionary? Exactly, Freak says, but different because this is my dictionary. Go on and look inside. I open up the book the way he asks, and the pages smell like a ballpoint pen. It starts with A, just like a regular dictionary, but as Freak said, it's different. A. Aardvark, a silly-looking creature that eats ants. Arg, what the aardvark says when it eats ants. Abacus, a finger-powered computer. Abscissa, the horizontal truth. You don't have to read them all tonight, Freak says. Save some for tomorrow. I gotta tell you, though, you're gonna flip when you see what I did with the Z's. This is the best getting Freak's dictionary. Everything else is extra. I figure it will take forever to fall asleep because my head is full of stuff. Grimmin is written down lump of coal, the pyramid with the special book inside, and how fat, wet flakes of snow were falling when the fair Gwen towed Freak home in his American flyer wagon, and the way he was pretending to boss her by saying, On Donner, on Dasher, on Guinevere! And she's telling him to shut up or she'll leave him outside where until he turns into a snowman. Which must be why I'm dreaming about little snowman who looks like Freak. The snowman keeps saying, Coal, coal! And when I wake up, I can feel the cold coming into my bedroom, which is weird because it's always warm in the down under with the furnace right next door. I think I hear the wind right there in the room, except it's not the wind. Someone breathing. Someone who rises up darker than night, as big as the room, and puts a giant hand on my face and presses down. Don't say a word, boy, he whispers. Not a sound. I try to move, try to shrink myself back into the bed, but the hand follows me down. The hand is so hard and strong I can't move, and it feels like my heart has stopped beating. It's waiting to see what will happen next. I came back, he says, like I promised. Chapter 16. A Chip Off the Old Block. Once on the TV, this dude hypnotized a lobster. Maybe you saw it. He touches a lobster and it freezes. It can't move. That's sort of what happens to me when his hand clamps over my mouth. Like I'm paralyzed and my head is empty and all there is in the world is that big hand and this cool breath like the wind. So this is where the geezers stuck you, huh? He whispers. Down in the basement. Out of sight, out of mind. I still can't see his face. He's this huge shape in the room. Everything changes now, he says. It's time I got to know my own son, who had his mind poisoned against me. He makes me sit up and shushes me to make sure I won't make any noise. Making noise is the last thing I want to do, because I don't know whether or not Grimm ever bought that gun he mentioned, or what might happen to him if he tries to use it. Grimm's bad dream about Grimm getting shot with his own gun seems pretty real right now, and I don't want to be the one to make it come true. I know what they told you, he says. It's all a big lie, you understand? I never killed anybody, and that's the truth, so help me God. By now I'm sitting up on the bed, and he's making me put on my clothes, and the weird thing is, none of this is a surprise. Somehow I always knew this would happen, that he would come for me in the night, that I would wake up to find him there, filling the room, and that I'd feel empty. I'm so weak, I can hardly put my shoes on. Like when you wake up and your arm is still asleep and you can't hardly make it move, that's what I feel like all over, numb and prickly and as light as a balloon, like my hands might float up in the air if I let them. This'll be an adventure, he says. You're going to have the time of your life, boy. Okay, we're leaving, and not a peep out of you. The bulkhead door is open, and you can see the stars. Some people think the stars look close enough to touch, but Freak says the sky is like a photograph from a billion years ago. It's just some old movie they're showing up there, and lots of those stars have switched off by now. They're already dead, and what we're seeing is the rerun, which makes sense if you think about it. 
Someday the rerun will come to an end and you'll see all the stars start to flick off like a billion little flames blown out by the wind. This way, he says, quiet as a mouse. There's snow on the ground, not a lot, enough to cover the ground. I can tell how cold the air is, but I can't feel it, even without a jacket, which I didn't have time to put on. The cold doesn't matter. Nothing matters, really. Not Grim and Graham or the old stars in the sky or Freak and the Fair Gwen. They're all just make-believe. This dream I was having for a long time, and now I'm awake again and he's still filling the room somehow, even though we're outside. The lights are out at Freak's house, and I'm thinking, the stars clicked off, and I don't even know why I'm thinking that. It's like a dead voice in my head or something. We're under a street light when he says, let me look at you. He's got these big eyebrows that make it hard to see his eyes, and that's fine. I don't want to see them. Looking at those eyes is asking to have a bad dream. My, my, he says, checking me out. Will you look at this? It's like I'm looking at an old picture of myself. You really are a chip off the old block, you know that? I don't say anything, and he reaches out and touches my face real gentle, as if he'd never heard a fly. I say, boy, do you know that? Answer me now. Yes, sir, I say. Everybody says so. Christmas Eve, he says. You know how many Christmas Eves I've been deprived of my own blood kin? Now is that fair? To do that to a man? Lock him up for a crime he never did? He's waiting for me to answer, and I say, No, sir, not fair. That's over and done now, he says. We're starting fresh. Just you and me, boy. That's how it was meant to be. I'm standing there under the streetlight, and it's amazing how quiet it is. Like everybody went away or died. The quiet is almost as big as he is. He's as tall as me, only wider everywhere. And for some reason, maybe because we're not far from Freak's house, I'm thinking this weird thought. He doesn't need a suit of armor. No, and he doesn't need a horse or a lance or a pledge to the king or the love of a fair lady. He doesn't need anything except what he is. He's everything all rolled into one, and no one can ever beat him, not even the brave Lancelot. He's squinting around. His eyebrows are furrowed shadows, and he says, You know what I think of when I see a neighborhood like this? Hamsters is what I think. That's how these people live, like hamsters in cages. They have their little wheels to run on, and that's what they do for the whole of their lives. They run and get nowhere. They just spin. I stand there. They poisoned you against me. I know that, he says. Give it time. You'll see the truth. He starts walking fast, and I walk with him, like my feet already know where to go. We're cutting through the side streets and heading down to the pond, all cold and white and frozen. Tomorrow morning, a bunch of kids will probably take their new sleds and skates out there and probably lose their new mittens and scarves and get yelled at by their moms and dads. But tonight, the pond is empty as the moon, as empty as my head. Once a car goes by real slow around the pond, and I've got this strange feeling there's no one at the wheel. He hooks his finger into my shirt collar and makes me duck down until the car goes by. The car passes and you can't see through the dark windows and you can hear the snow crunching under the tires, squeaky and frozen. We're invisible, he says, making me stand up. Now, now, isn't that a kick in the pants? My feet already know where we're going. The New Testaments. There's a few lights on them in the old buildings and you can see some of the windows are cracked. It looks like a knife cut against the light and he's saying, you know about Mary and Joseph, how they sought shelter in Bethlehem and how the baby Jesus was born in a manger? I try to nod, and the funny thing is, even though it's I'm not cold, my teeth are chattering. Like, it's like the rest of me is freezing, but my head hasn't noticed. That's what we're doing, seeking shelter, he says. Except this isn't exactly a manger we're going to. No, sir, I say. It sure isn't. He touches me real soft on the back of the neck and says, I didn't ask you a question, boy. Rule number one, don't sass your old man. I make sure my mouth stays shut. We're coming up on the testaments, and they look almost pretty with the new snow coating the roofs and making the yards clean and white and soft. You can see where an old bike handlebar is coming up through the snow, and shapes of other things left out. And even the old car up on the blocks looks new, like it might take off into the air without any wheels. I know where we're going, even though he doesn't tell me. The door opens before we get there, and Loretta Lee is standing in the light, and she's saying, Iggy, come here, look what the cat dragged in! He says, Say hello to my boy, Loretta. Ain't he a chip off the old block? Then we're inside, and Iggy is there bolting the door behind us and closing the shades. 
And Loretta, she's wearing this real slinky red dress that looks like it might fall off if she sneezed. She's saying, Mission accomplished! Hey, Kenny, I knew you could do it if anybody could. Iggy says, Watch your mouth, Loretta! I do believe you've been drinking, my father says. Has she been drinking, Iggy? I thought I made myself clear. Hey, it's Christmas Eve, Iggy says, and he sounds real nervous. A little punch? What can it hurt? A little punch, Loretta says, and her voice is slurpy. That's all. She's wearing these fake eyelashes, and they're coming loose, so her eyes look almost as blurry as her red mouth. I know because she keeps flapping her eyes at me and smiling, so I can see where the lipstick got on her teeth. Iggy says, She's okay, Kenny. You got my word. Oh, right, Loretta says. Turned over a new leaf. Preacher King turned over a new leaf, so there's no booze for anybody on Christmas Eve, even in your own house where a man is his castle. Oh, shut it, Iggy says, and he makes Loretta sit down on the busted couch, where she kind of leans over and waves at me, wink, wink. Bring me and my boys some food, my father says. We've been out in the cold for eight long years, and we're hungry, aren't we, son? Yes, sir, I say. Iggy goes out into the kitchen to fry up some hamburgers, and we sit there waiting, not saying anything. Loretta is snuggled up on the couch, passed out with this dreamy look on her face. I eat that greasy hamburger, even though I can hardly stand to swallow, and Iggy is fussing around like it's such a big deal having Kenny Kane in the house, and it's hard to believe he's the same Iggy who is boss of the Panheads, this motorcycle gang that strikes fear into the hearts of everybody, including the cops. Then Loretta wakes up and stretches like a cat, yawning so you can practically see right down her throat, and she says, I guess I needed that. Then she giggles, hiding her mouth. I guess I need a lot of things. My father wipes his mouth with his folded up paper napkin and he ignores her and looks at Iggy and says, You ever do time? You could be a cook. Iggy gives this nervous heh heh heh, like wouldn't that be fun, being a cook in prison. He says, Anytime you want, I'll show you that place I told you about. My father stands up. Now is good, he says. He looks right at me. Come on, boy.